You may get a few bob strike pay. You're living on the bread line. Nobody's there to help you. I've been there, I've done it. It is not nice. It is not something that you will be vote for. At the end of the day, when you go on strike, it is a huge decision for both you, your family, and your colleagues, and, and everybody around you. And trade unions do not take that decision lightly. I don't care what anybody says. I've been at it for many, many years, as has the Lord Mayor. It is something we struggle with, and struggle with time and all of So for us, to our, our members, to battle to go up and strike is a real difficult for us to do as, as trade unions. Colleagues, across your both national and regional governments recognise the value of the trade unions and work in partnership at all levels within the European Union. We know and we're aware that Europe has introduced many laws that protect the unions and its members, ranging from health and safety to stopping exploitation of workers, something that this government is intent on destroying. We see many, many multinational companies recognise the value of the unions and the members like the GM, Nissan, Jaguar Land Rover, Coca-Cola, Airbus, Siemens, to put name but a few, all work with trade unions and see the trade unions have been an integral part of their business, an important part of their business. At the end of the day, it is the workers that deliver for those companies. Close to the home, we have our own unions in the Liverpool City Council who have worked, worked with the council in an honest and pragmatic way to assist us to manage the massive cuts that have been imposed by this government. The reality is, the reality is, without the help and support from the trade union leadership, its members and the entire workforce of the Liverpool City Council, this council would have fallen over a long time ago. In conclusion, I would ask the council to support this motion, because not to support it will lead to untold misery on the residents of our city and well beyond. Thank you. This new elected Tory government is behaving at the minute like a, a drunk man at closing time in a public house looking for a fight. It's inventing problems <laughs> where, <laughs> where none exist. I'll pretend I didn't hear that. The, um, you would think, from the way the government rhetoric is being pitched in relation to this issue, that we were facing an unprecedented wave of strike, strike days, uh, days lost through strikes, that the police were uh, in one unified voice arguing for some form of statutory enforcement of the voluntary picketing picket code because there have been wholesale transgressions and numerous criminal violations on the picket line. And yet, none of those two situations is true. We know in this city that we have a history of working exceptionally well with our trade unions within Liverpool City Council. There is no way that we could have delivered the scale of change that we've had to absorb in the last five to six years without the active support and cooperation and partnership with our trade union colleagues. And I sat across the table with our trade union colleagues and had difficult discussions on difficult issues across the board from uh, pay, terms and conditions, facility time, single status and other issues. And I can say at every single step they defended their interests of their members properly and efficiently and very well. Uh, and we managed to find a way through. We could not have delivered this scale change without that sense of mutual cooperation. We also know that in this region, that various times both of our car plants would have gone they would have closed had it not been for the active cooperation of the trade unions who are organised in those plants. Most recently, given the financial crash and the, th the financial viability of Vauxhalls or General Motors being threatened within the United States, we knew that we were at real risk of losing the plant at Ellesmere Port. The only reason that plant stayed is because of the excellent partnership work done by the trade unions here, and they secured the long-term existence of this plant. Let's be quite clear. The government claims that there is a lack of democratic accountability in some of the ballot results. Uh, now, I, I can't speak with the, with the experience of uh, Councillor Hanson, the, the Mayor, uh, Councillor Hont in particular, with some of the day-to-day -day workings of these matters. But what I can say is that I know the trade unions have publicly said to the Tories, if you want to increase the amount of voter turnout in a trade union ballot, there's an easy way to do that, and that is to allow our members to vote online. Time and time again, the Tory government has pushed back 
and said no. They said, oh, there may be issues about security. Well, in my phone here, I have an app which allows me to do telephone banking. That is an encrypted service allowing full security. I know that for our Labour leadership election, I voted online through a secure mechanism organised by the Electoral Reform Society. And I know, height of hypocrisy, that the Tory party itself organised its own London mayoral campaign election online for its party members. If it's good enough for them, why on earth isn't it good enough to allow our trade union partners to That factor alone shows clearly what is at play here. This is not an attempt to seek a greater justice in society. We know on this side of the, of the council chamber, and I hopefully across the council chamber, that the reasons why the trade unions are given uh, a particular role in our democracy is because the workplace power is naturally imbalanced. The employer holds most of the cards, and as a consequence, in order to achieve a greater balance of that democracy, ever since the toll Bible martyrs, the balance of, um, uh, of power within the negotiation process had had to be evened out. This is a clear attempt to try, once again, to unravel that fabric of democracy which has led to the settlement since the toll pardon martyrs. Without this opportunity to ensure that it remains in place, it is clear that the Tories are, once again, drunk on power, trying to flick a fight where none is needed, and trying to unravel and tear through that thread, that fabric of democracy, they will live to regret it, we will all live to regret it. Must not be allowed. Thanks, Councillor Brant. I would suggest technically that was your maiden speech on this. Uh... Definitely have a maiden in this chamber, yeah. <laughs> uh, Councillor Simon. I'm really proud to stand here uh, to support this motion tonight as an active trade unionist all my working life and as a woman, given now in this country over 50% of trade union membership is women and, and because they've had to fight for every right they've ever achieved. And I think when we see the anniversary of the Equal Pay Act this week and so many women still not achieving equal pay, people going on strike or taking industrial action for things they believe in isn't about pay. Most industrial action actually that has taken place in this country generally is about conditions of service or injustices that take place at work. Very few are about pay except where it's really, really necessary. I think some of the things that have been said before I won't repeat but I think it is important to note not just um, the work the trade unions do in the workplace, the work that they do internationally for workers and really to fight for our brothers and sisters who don't have that right and who don't have the de democratic rights that we have as well. So there's all that international work that trade unions do and by trying to bring the trade union movement in this country also threatens workers right across the globe who rely on us for our solidarity. I also think it's really, really important, you know, that we need to think about people who are on low pay, who are on zero hour contracts, who now more than ever need the trade unions. A lot of them in that workforce are also women. So I think, you know, everybody in this chamber should be right behind this motion. Everybody in this chamber should be opposing the trade union legislation that's coming forward. People have already spoke. There are already more checks and measures in place in this country uh, to, to try and break the unions than ever before. And this bill just is not necessary. And I just think we all need to stand together, united, in Liverpool, to actually give a strong and clear message to the Tory government that we support workers and we support workers' rights here in this chamber. <laughs> Um, thank you, my Lord Mayor. I'm, um, I'm a trade union member of Unite the Union. And um, I think the, the uh, Councillor Hanson, sorry, sorry, comments, so sorry, <laughs> comments, um, you wouldn't have them, you would. The um, Councillor Hanson was right, the, the, uh, the, the attack on trade union membership and freedom of association um, started during the Thatcher period. In 1981, there were 12 and a half million trade union members in the country over half the workforce. Today there are about six and a half million members. Forty percent of public sector workers are members of trade unions. 
I think only about 12, 12 and a half percent of people in the private sector are trade union members. You know, Councillor Simon mentioned uh, what we've already debated in this chamber a few times before about the scourge of low pay in our city, 20, 20, nearly a fifth, more than a fifth of people in the city who are working and below the living wage. A lot of people are uh, having to suffer the, the consequences of working under zero hours contracts or as agency workers. The vast majority of those workplaces are non-unionised and obviously it's an obvious point to make that if those places were unionised, would they be having to suffer those kind of terms and conditions of employment that take us back to the early 20th and the 19th century? So just in terms of, in terms of the motion of point three, I just sort of suggest in terms of fleshing that out, it says to continue the value, to value the importance of meaningful workforce engagement and representation. But I think that we should encourage uh, old schools to make sure that they teach young people about trade union membership as part of their understanding of civic society. I think that all apprenticeship providers and training providers in the city should do exactly the same and offer all those young people who are on apprenticeships the opportunity of understanding what a trade union is and of joining a trade union. And I think that all the work programme providers in the city, as part of their employability, should also be teaching those people who are in, uh, unemployed in that situation about the benefit of being in a trade union and where the opportunities are to join them. So this isn't just about us today, this is also about our children and other people coming forward. So that next, so the next 10 years hopefully we can say that over 12, 20, 15 million people are members of trade unions again as they once were. Uh, thanks a lot, Mayor. And, uh, Councillor Hanson said that he thought 50% of his speech had been taken, and another 50% had been taken. I wasn't great at match, but I've been asked to speak after the leader of the Joint Trade Unions in Liverpool, the Mayor, the Barrister, an economist, a lawyer, and senior trade union official. But I've still got something to say on this. <laughs> and you wouldn't expect anything less from someone who was a trade union official trying to stop me speaking. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the thinking behind this legislation. I'm going to take you back to 1984, and I'm not going through every year as we go along. In 1984, Rodney uh made a speech at the TUC about GCHQ uh, and the government of the day. Uh, and for those who don't know or can't remember, Rodney Bickerstaff was the leader of New P and then later Unison, uh, General Secretary of Unison, and you know, a well respected man of integrity and a great champion of, of low paid workers. For those who don't know or would rather forget, uh, GCHQ was the government's uh, listening centre, supply centre, and the government of the day at that time, in 1984, was led by someone called Margaret Thatcher. Now, that government in 1984 had decided to ban trade union membership at GCHQ. They had a clear view of uh, how the country should be governed. Uh, it was supported by the flawed economic theories of someone called Milton Friedman, and their view was that the market should be allowed to run its course. No matter if that led to job losses, no matter if it led to a widening divide in society, no matter if it led to higher unemployment, the market knows best. And that was the mantra of the Tory government at the time which may sound familiar to those of you who are watching this lot at the moment. And an integral part of that policy was that trade unions were the enemy within. Uh, and let's face it, they saw the enemy within for a number of reasons. And the main reason was that trade unions asked for things. They asked for a fair pay structure. They asked for secure employment. They asked for sick pay. They asked for equal pay. They asked for holiday pay. Now that's the kind of thing that makes life difficult for some employers. Um, this government, the government of the day in 1984, considered those to be the objectives of the enemy within. But enough history. I mentioned Rodney Bickerstaff's speech because what he said in 1984, and Councillor Robertson Collins can tell you, you can still get it on the TUC website, that's what I got from, uh, is just as relevant today as it was 31 years ago. The government today are pushing through the trade union bill in the face of opposition from all the other parties in the House of Commons, all the other parties. And there's even some Conservative MPs who've spoken against this bill. Now they won't vote against it because the discipline in their party is quite good, but they will speak against it. 
Um, as all I want, to, I won't go on now. But all I want to say that as as both an elected trade union official and later as a full-time trade union official, I was fortunate enough to see for myself to see firsthand uh, some of the things that Councillor Simon referred to, where trade unionists are defending human rights and working with communities in places where they are putting their lives on the line to do that. You know, in Namibia, in Zimbabwe, in the Middle East, across Europe, in South, in South America, in Central America. I saw firsthand the courage and determination of people who were proud to stand up as trade unionists. So it is important to oppose this bill, not just for the UK, not just for our country, but to send the message out that trade unions are a force for good in society. There's people who've been killed simply for saying they're a trade unionist, not for anything they did, simply for being a trade unionist. And I think this piece of tawdry legislation tries to portray trade unionists as enemies of progress and enemies of the people. So I ask uh, councillors, I've asked members to oppose, to support the motion and do everything they can to oppose the, the trade union bill. And like Councillor Simon, I'm asking all members, all members of the chamber to support this motion. This isn't policy political in this chamber. This is about people trying to present trade unionists as enemy of the people. So please support the motion. We have two more speakers, Councillor Ladford and Councillor Brown, then go to the room. Um, my Lord Mayor, um, for 29 years um, I had to work with trade unions and I had the pleasure of working with trade unions as a personnel manager. Some of the contributions have been made from people, quite rightly, from a trade union background. I think it's actually helpful to the debate to say from someone who normally had to sit on the other side of the table, something positive. I had to deal as a personal manager when some of my executives always went missing when there was a redundancy announcement. And I had to deal with trade unions, some of whom were members of the Communist Party, some members of the Labour Party, and some people from different positions. I can absolutely tell you their support in dealing with serious financial problems made some of our managers look. Their contribution to deal with the economic reality of companies reappraising marketplace economics, reinvesting, their total support uh, was absolutely fundamental to my firm going forward as an international trading company. And I think it's important we just don't get people from one side of the industrial fence or one side of the political fence saying it. I can tell you the vast majority of professional personal managers and business private managers believe trade unions can be responsible and good influences. And I'll tell you the one exception. It is often poor management is terrified of trade unions exposing their inadequacies. The vast majority of managers will conduct and debate with trade union representatives. Secondly, <coughs> Trade unions have made a fundamental benefit to society in, in the, the way the UK has reduced health and safety problems. Trade unions go out, they train health and safety inspectors at the workplace, and that has driven forward terrific improvements on us driving down the rates of accidents at the workplace. That could not have been done by just depending on employers. So I say that is something we need to put on the table. In 1904, members of my party, the Liberal Party, and members of the Labour Party were faced with an attack from a Conservative government and judges who want to destroy trade unions. Tough failed judgment. And they actually got together for the Glasgow Macdonald electoral pact to create a progressive government. That progressive government with a common platform secured a two thirds majority in Westminster. It wasn't by shying away from progressive politics, it was putting it at the forefront. When oh, Cal so the, you, you do need to round up now, I did. I, I, I would just say one light aside. When Councillor Brand said about online balloting, 
I'll just give one little um, word of warning. Members of the Tory party were lobbying to vote for a certain member of the Labour leadership by using online facilities. So maybe online isn't always as good as it should be. Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can, I, uh, can I thank Councillor Hanson for bringing this to the Chamber and the uh, other comments that have been made by uh, other members here. Um, I speak here as a, a member of the trade union, I've been a member of the trade union all of my working life, all of my adult life. Um, I agree with the content of the motion. Um, the reason I'm speaking now is because I think the timing is unfortunate in that the um, third reading of the, the bill uh, was held yesterday and therefore it's going to the House of Lords now. And I think any um, decent opportunity that we've had to oppose the, the, uh, the bill has now passed, unfortunately. And that's why I brought a motion to the last meeting of the uh, Employment and Skills um, Committee on the 22nd of October, which asked for a letter to be sent to the Parliamentary Public Bill Committee um, confirming our opposition to the bill. Um, I don't know yet whether that was actually sent or not, but um, I do think that unfortunately time has passed us by. We are in accordance with the comments, sentiments, content of the motion has been put forward by Council Hanson. Uh, it's just unfortunate, I think, with the timing that certainly may have missed the vote with regard to um, substantial opposition to the bill. Thank you. Can we move to the, uh, the vote? All those in favour? Is that unanimous? Yeah. Thank you. Come on out. development 
providing policy advice and facilitating multilateral communication among the me member governments. The whole ethos around the Commonwealth is about creating economical opportunity, championing small states, empowering leaders, and promoting inclusive development. Just a bit of facts for the people who love figures. Trade between Commonwealth countries is estimated at over $680 billion in 2015 and projected to surpass $1 trillion for 2020. Half of the top 20 global emerging cities are in the Commonwealth. Notably, eight of the top 10 countries with the lowest level of corruption are Commonwealth members. Eight of the top 10 countries <coughs> for gender equality are Commonwealth countries. I can go on and on listing the benefits and from the Commonwealth countries. Many of us would have remember reading books or hearing stories about men and women who came to diff from different Commonwealth countries to help Britain during the war and after the war. Today in Liverpool and other cities throughout England, there are generations of people from different Commonwealth countries enriching various cities. I am one of such person who came to the UK when the country needed us most. I came when the NHS had little or no staff to deliver nursing care, and it was worse off than what we hear about today in the news. I fell in love with the city, and of course the rest is history. I, like many others from different Commonwealth countries who have made Liverpool their home, want to help this city be recognized for what it is, a Commonwealth city. Members may be aware, recently, Liverpool Commonwealth Association was formed, which is made up of almost 100 members. This organization is supported by various sectors in the community and Liverpool as a whole. I believe Liverpool, having had the title of Capital Culture, remains a unique city. For this reason, I call on the Mayor, through the support of this council, to lobby the Commonwealth Secretariat, the LGA, MPs, and other influential individuals to work with Liverpool and accredit us as a Commonwealth city. Notably, to also write to the Royal Commonwealth Society, asking them to formally recognize the Liverpool Commonwealth Association. Just in closing, I would like to add a quote from Kamalish Sharma, who is the Commonwealth Secretariat General. He stated, the Commonwealth is distinctive because of what it is, a family of 53 countries that has come together in affinity and kingship, despite the diversity of its members and their distance from each other. The vision of all of us in this chamber should be that we want Liverpool to be a sustainable city, a city that is resilient in trade, investment, culture and diversity, a city that has shared values. Like the Liverpool Commonwealth Association, we should be supporting members and partners within this city to improve the well-being of citizens and to advance their shared values through interest locally and globally. This is the same principle that holds the Commonwealth nations together. Council, today I urge you to support this motion as it stands to enable our great and loved city, Liverpool, to be accredited and recognized as a city it is, a Commonwealth city. Thank you. Another notice of an amendment by Councillor Crow. Uh, Councillor Kemp has indicated he'd like to speak. Do you want to wait till after the amendment? Uh, yes, I want to speak against the amendment. Councillor, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Excuse me. Is there a second or third?
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so basically, our, our amendment was tabled because we felt the motion, as it stood, was excessively uh, prescriptive and we should get the status as a Commonwealth city first. However, having heard first Chief Angus and then Councillor Council Nicholas both speak so well and so persuasively, we decided we would withdraw our, motion, uh, our amendment. Thank you. I still like to, I, I welcome that, uh, because I thought, uh, my Lord Mayor, that this would have, the amendment would have narrowed what we want to do. I see no reason at all why we couldn't have a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting here in this city. It's actually a smaller event than the International Festival of Businesses, but incredibly prestigious. Why don't we aim for the top thing that the Commonwealth could do? Why don't we promote those diaspora communities in this city to work with their home countries, with their friends, their relatives, their former fellow pupils, back in those countries to develop links between this city uh, and their home country. I was very pleased uh, that uh, we can work non-politically here and to thank Chief Trichomega and indeed the Mayor for the comments they made about my contribution to setting this up. I'm very privileged, my Lord Mayor, to be very much involved in Commonwealth and overseas work. In fact, I've just received, I haven't told uh, Erica this, uh, an invitation to go and speak at the Afro Cities event. But when I go particularly to Africa, I become so aware that what is often seen as an anachronism in this country, the Commonwealth is not a bit of the old empire, isn't it something that's dead and buried? You go to Africa and talk to mayors and ministers in Africa about the Commonwealth and you realise just how important it is. And by the time they get here, we mightn't have 53 members because more countries, including possibly Japan, which has never been a former colony, are interested in joining the Commonwealth because of the good they know it brings to the world. It can bring it to the world, and I would like to congratulate uh, Councillor Nicholas on her maiden speech in the way that she so vividly described. But that is an organisation which we can appropriately take advantage of. So I'm very much in favour of this resolution, but I would just warn you about some of the technicalities of this, which I tried to get dealt with at the drafting stage. The Commonwealth Secretariat does not credit cities, it credits governments who are in the Commonwealth. By all means, please tell them we exist, but don't look for accreditation uh, to them. The Commonwealth Parliamentary Association is an association of parliaments, it's a training organisation. By all means, tell them we exist and what we're doing. Perhaps that's a good practice for them but don't seek accreditation there, because they don't do it. And the Commonwealth Local Government Federation uh, Forum actually knows all about us, because I'm very pleased that uh, we are a member of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum via our LGA membership, and if we weren't, Councillor Small couldn't be, not Liverpool's representative on that, but the UK's representative. So I'm all in favour of this resolution, but I think we need to be careful when the Chief Executive, whoever sends the letters, that we word these letters to reflect what the relationship with those organisations might be. But that doesn't deflect one inch, one iota, from the fact that I believe that this motion is very important for Liverpool. It puts Liverpool in the driving seat of a new relationship with some of those emerging democracies, those emerging economies, and that's good for them. It's good for us. It's a win-win situation. And I'm proud that the City Council that I'm a member of is taking such a positive international lead when too many others are seeking to increase our boundaries. We're seeking to take them down so we can use those relationships prof profitably for all concerned. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and uh, thank you to Councillor Nicholas for an excellent maiden speech, and actually also for leading on the Women's Forum in the Liverpool Commonwealth Association. 
Uh, thank you to Chief Angus, and also we omitted to mention uh, Garth Dallas, who came up to the uh, dais there to speak earlier, and to other members of the Commonwealth Association at the back of the room there. Um, let's not get tied up in technicalities or process, let's talk about diversity and inclusivity. And this is a proud city, and one that maybe for too long hasn't necessarily recognised uh, the 53 nations and in fact the 60 languages and the over 100 countries that make up Liverpool and it's not just about being Irish and being Scottish and being English but it's about who's made us what we are and that is what the Commonwealth has done and done so well and I was really proud to see Chief Angus present for the first time a wreath remembering those that have given their lives and have been injured and have worked with the merchant seamen and the seafarers and the army and the navy and the air force and the, air force and the combined forces over all of our conflicts and presented a wreath to the senator long overdue. Thank you to everyone for getting involved in the Commonwealth Association and thank you to Councillor Kemp for helping set this up and I'm proud to be its new chair and I'm proud to call every one of our members of the Commonwealth friends and long-term friends. So thank you so much. Councillor Nicholas, would you like to write some advice before we go to the Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would just like to read to, read to this chamber, to councillors present, the importance of supporting this motion. And we have had for this year, don't quote me, uh, Councillor Kemp, but over six um, High Commissioners visited our city. And this was before we formally had a um, Liverpool Commonwealth Association. So there is an interest. So, you know, and it's about, I've spoken to three High Commissioners who have said they would lobby the MPs in terms of the uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary um, Forum. So, there is, let's not, the sky is the limit for Liverpool. Let's not, you know, restrict ourselves, but let's embrace the culture and diversity that we have. Thank you. All those in favour? Is that unanimous? Okay, thank you. Item 14. Older People Awards by Councillor Sherrod Woodhouse, Ella Lowe and Shannon Sullivan. Yes. Can I now invite uh, Councillor Woodhouse to do the motion standing in his name, but also to advise the Council that this will be Councillor uh, Woodhouse's maiden speech. Thank you, Lord Mayor. As you know, I'm a shy and retiring person. <laughs> I love to voice my opinions. But that isn't why I've waited until now to make my maiden speech. I've waited until I could speak about a subject that's important to me. Something that I feel passionate about. And that's how I feel about improving the, the quality of life for older people in this city. The Mayor appointed me Mayor on Need for Older People in 2012 as he recognised the need to introduce measures to improve the quality of life for older people in Liverpool. Despite the government cuts that we, are, that we were and still are facing, too many of our older people were lonely, with decline in health and mobility, inadequate housing, reduced employment opportunities and financial problems. Many families were caring for their elderly relatives without enough support. Since then, in partnership with our RSLs and voluntary sectors and private sectors, we have worked hard to deliver action on the ground. We have provided shopping buses to allow those with mobility problems, their independence, to do their own shopping. We have organised holidays to Blackpool and Wales and day trips to market towns, including taking a 73-year-old lady from County who hadn't been anywhere outside the city for decades. On little cabaret afternoons, 
are having a huge impact in helping our older people to socialise. They are a vital service to some, including one lady who was particularly vulnerable after losing her husband. This lady had been out socially for many years and felt afraid to even leave the house. We provided her with a buddy to help develop her confidence and encouraged her to come along to our cabaret afternoons. That lady has received a new lease of life. She now volunteers at our events, helping those who feel how she used to, alone and afraid. We provide transport to these events to help those with reduced mobility. We have the Benefits Maximisation Team present at events to offer advice to our residents who are struggling financially. We develop skills in our older people who in turn go out in their communities teaching others, old and young alike. We have created an older persons forum providing a platform for older people to address issues affecting them. Earlier this year, we hosted the North West Older Persons Champions, a meeting put together by our older people to share our, our best practice and see our great work. The Help and Hand Scheme is helping to break the digital divide by providing specially adapted iPads to our older residents in which they can do their shopping or see what activities are happening around them. At the recent Older Persons Awards, we recognised and applauded the contribution those aged 65 plus bring to our communities. This year was the most successful, yet with over 800 nominations for awards, such as Outstanding Community Volunteer and the Outstanding Active Person. We are well underway planning for Christmas, with 2,000 plus people across the city attending parties organised by local councillors. We started off delivering 200 winter warm packs in 2012. In 2012. This year, we will be delivering 1,000 across this city. We are working closely with the White Christmas organisation to support their community events, hosting hundreds of our elderly residents who would have been alone on Christmas Day. All this would not have been possible without the fantastic support from our staff and partners, particularly Collect Seaweed and Adult Services, Karen Cox at LMH, John Kelly at LHT, Riverside Housing, Collect McGuire at South Liverpool Housing, Jackie Conley at Plus Dane, Julian Flanagan from the Flanagan Group, Age Concern and Local Solutions. Do we need to do more? Can we do more? Yes, we can, and we do. We need to realise that an age-friendly city is not just a city friendly towards older people, but all our residents, whatever their age, ability, or social status. We need to realise that an age-friendly city is a city for all ages, which includes our oldest and youngest residents to build strong, inclusive communities. It is a city that is connected not only physically by substantial public transport, but also digitally. It is a city that is active and healthy, breaking national statistics for health, health outcomes and life expectancy. It is a city that is enjoyable to live in and raise a family in and grow old in. We may call this many different names.